What is up you guys? Welcome back to my channel and if you're new here just welcome. My name is Gemma Jade but today we are going to be discussing part two of the disappearance and death of Kelly Nash. If you didn't see part one I'll put it right here for you right here for you. It'll be up there somewhere and just go back check that out and then make sure you come back to this one for the conclusion. Before we get started, I just want to give a disclaimer that I am not claiming to be an expert on anything in any way, shape, or form. Also, I do not know anyone in the family. I did not know Kelly, and I am not familiar with anyone who is closely involved with this case. I am simply a creator who has a heart for things that are suspicious, deaths that are suspicious, disappearances. And I think that the public should know about them. I'm very curious about this case, why it ended the way it did, what happened. My intentions are not to harm, hurt, cause any pain, grief, stress to anybody involved. And my heart goes out, my deepest respect and sympathies to the loved ones, family members, friends, and the people who knew Kelly Nash. With that being said, let's see where we left off. Just to give a quick review of where we left off in the first video, Tracy, the search and rescue woman with her dogs, had gone out to the docks by Lake Lanier, which one of the docks was behind Kelly's father's home. The dogs went from dock to dock, each dog to each dock. On the sixth dock from where they started searching, each dog individually hit on Kelly's scent on this sixth dock. So the area within a five mile radius, land, air, and the lake were searched and nothing was found. There was no sign of Kelly. Kelly was not found and everyone was right back kind of where they started. They hadn't found anything despite the dog sniffing in that spot. They had taken sonar into the lake, divers into the lake, they had aerial searches. And because the weather had calmed down on this day, the volunteers also went out and there were hundreds of them. But it was all for nothing. It was all to no avail. On Sunday, January 11th, 2015, exactly one week to the day that Kelly Nash was last seen relaxing, playing video games, hanging out with his girlfriend in his living room, the official search was called off. Because the five mile radius was searched and nothing was found, the police were kind of figuring like, where could he be? Would he still be in this area at this point? This had to have been absolutely devastating to all involved. I can't even imagine going through all of this pain, all of this grief, all of this effort just to end up a week later right back at square one, no closer to finding my loved one, no closer even to having a clue as to what happened to him, where he ended up. My gosh, I can't even imagine. Kelly's father, Alan, explained that on one hand, it was kind of comforting because obviously they hadn't found a body or anything. They hadn't found Kelly injured. So that meant he could still be out there. You know, he could still be out there somewhere for them to find or for him to come home. On the other hand, though, he said how frustrating it was because he said, quote, well, where can he possibly be if not anywhere that was already searched, end quote. At this point, Holly said that she was actually hoping and praying and trying to convince herself that it was all of the media, the volunteers, all of the police attention that was keeping Kelly away. Like maybe he had decided that he needed to walk off to get a break from everybody. And he was so incredibly, according to Holly, non-confrontational. He avoided it at all costs. I know what that's like. That once he saw the police there, he thought maybe he was going to get in trouble. Once he saw the media he might have felt some type of way about coming out then because of all the attention he was going to get. Was he going to get in trouble for wasting resources at this point? So that's what Holly was trying to convince herself. And I don't really blame her. I mean, anything that you can hold on to at this point. Keep in mind that just because the official search with the authorities was called off, that doesn't mean that the family stopped their search. They still carried out a very intensive search they just went beyond the five mile radius. They knew that he wasn't in that general vicinity, but they still had quite a few volunteers that were willing to go and search even further. They started putting up billboards throughout the entire county. They started getting media to spread the word even further. They were going further and further with the flyers, anything they can do to get the word out that Kelly was still in fact missing. Unfortunately though, eventually, after a couple of days, the volunteers really dwindled down to just maybe a handful of people and Kelly's family and close friends. 
They were focused on getting Kelly's name, face, and information implanted into the heads, brains, and minds of the rest of the country, the rest of the county, the rest of the world, if need be. They were not stopping and fully determined to find Kelly. However, all of this was to no avail. Kelly Natch seemed to have vanished into thin air. So here is the point in the case where I start to wonder if maybe the parameters for the missing 411 search criteria should be expanded. I'm obviously not saying that that's exactly what this is. I'm just saying that what we eventually find out happened to Kelly, plus all of the suspicious deaths, all of the strange things that have happened in, around, and near Lake Lanier, maybe someone should start investigating and considering it. I mean, so much has happened around in and near this lake that it's actually known for suspicious deaths and drownings. It just kind of makes me wonder what happened here? What exactly is this? Unfortunately, those are things we don't know. Those are unanswered questions. But let's talk about what we do know. What happened to Kelly Nash? On Sunday, February 8th, 2015, nearly 35 days to the exact day that Kelly was last seen and then went missing, there was a major development in the case. A development which changed the entire status. Kelly Nash was no longer missing. Kelly Nash was now deceased. Nearly five weeks to the day, as I said, the police received a phone call from a resident living on Lake Lanier. The caller reported that a fisherman had seen a body floating in the lake near their dock. The scene is just a few miles away from Kelly and Jessica's house, and when the police showed up the next day, the body was almost immediately identified as Kelly Nash. He was found in the same pajamas he was last seen in, and not very surprisingly to me because of everything I know about search and rescue dogs, the dock that he was found near, the resident who called the police dock, was the sixth dock from where the search and rescue dog started searching, the dock where all three of Tracy Sargent's dogs had hit on Kelly's scent. Although there were sonar scans done on the bottom of the lake looking for Kelly's body right when the dogs had hit, presumably what had happened was the body had drifted outside the general search parameters and just wasn't found because it had sunk to the bottom. So basically he was no longer in the area of that dock when the searchers came out, the dogs were just scenting him from, you know, the week prior. He had floated away and sunk to the bottom and he was outside of the sonar scan area. He was not found where it was assumed he had entered the water, entering the water at that dock. Authorities almost immediately said that they did not suspect foul play and that they felt that Kelly's body had been in the water for the entire 35 days, the entirety of his disappearance. Kelly Nash's official cause of death was a bullet wound to the head. Although, to this day, more than six years later, that gun was never found. It was presumably his pistol that he had uh, allegedly carried with him that night that made the shot in his head, but the pistol was never found despite the lake being searched numerous times. Now, let's go over some theories and after that, I'm going to drop a little bombshell on you after I go over all of the tiny little things that have been kind of been nagging at me as I went through this information. And I'm sure most of you picked up on this stuff too. So we talked about some of it in part one. Let's go full blown. Let's get into theories, what I think, what I've picked up. And I want you guys to let me know in the comments what you think and what your theories are and why. So the theory that seems to me to be what police are pushing onto the public as fact and not theory is that Kelly Nash had taken his own life with a bullet wound to the head. There are a few things that allegedly point to this being the case. One being that when he was seen walking on that incredibly grainy, far away and blurry footage that everyone just assumed was Kelly Nash, but nobody actually knows for a fact, whoever that person was seemed to be walking by themselves. So let's presume for this theory's sake, that that was Kelly. So he was walking by himself, so it's not possible he was going to meet someone for whatever reason. That's a whole other can of worms, right? So he was walking by himself to go and take his own life. Remember, this is the official statement from the police. Obviously not word for word, but this is basically what I got. I keep calling it a theory, but this is kind of what I gathered that they're saying happened. So Kelly randomly got up after showing absolutely 
No signs whatsoever of even being depressed, let alone suicidal. He decided to get up in the middle of the night after saying goodnight to his girlfriend and decided to rush off to the lake to go and do this with his own gun, which he otherwise never even used. In fact, he was so desperate to randomly do this, he didn't put on a jacket, didn't dress properly for the weather, but I guess if you're going to take your own life, you don't really care about freezing on your way to get there. I don't know, maybe adrenaline if this was the case. He left the door open, possibly leaving his girlfriend in danger. He left no note, even though I'm sure he knew that his family, friends, and loved ones were going to wonder where he was, why he did it, and what happened to him. Not to mention the way that it was done was they believed that he pulled the trigger while in the water so he would leave no blood or no sign that that's what he did. So Kelly Nash, who was a perfectly seemingly normal um, individual, no history of drug use, no history of depression, no history of suicide, was in a really great mood, doing very well in school, making plans for the future, had a great job, best friends with his father, this really wonderful tight-knit family, a girlfriend that he was totally in love with, decided that not only was he going to take his own life, he wasn't going to leave a note and he was going to do it in such a way that nobody would be able to find him. Sounds legit so far. So what I'm wondering is a few things. Number one, where did he have the gun? Was he walking down the street just holding a firearm, figuring it was the middle of the night and it was dark, nobody was going to see him? Okay, maybe he could have put it in the waistband of his pajama pants, but if the figure that was seen walking at four o'clock or 4.30 in the morning was Kelly Nash with as fast and kind of walking like he was cold as that person was, is it a reasonable assumption to make that the gun would have stayed in place? And let's not forget, he was in such a rush to do this that he also didn't even bother finishing playing his Xbox game. He was just sitting there and said, yep, now's the time. I'm gonna go take my own life and flew out the house in no clothes. And I'm not trying to be comedic. This is how unreasonable this all sounds to me. As far as what I read on like Reddit and a few other sources about the family is that they seem to have accepted this. I can't say that for absolute fact though, because I haven't heard any of them speak for themselves or speak about whether or not they feel this is what happened to Kelly. And if they do, why? And if they don't, why? I have no idea so I'm not claiming to be speaking for the family. I'm simply saying what I've seen from people who claim to have access to the family or access to the family's social media at the very least, that they're accepting this as fact. That somehow they were convinced that Kelly was hiding so well this depression and suicide ideation. Now, the official police report as far as to the public and what they said to the media did not say that Kelly had ended his own life. They kind of said it though in a roundabout way because what they basically said was Kelly Nash was found in Lake Lanier with a bullet wound to the head which was his cause of death but no foul play was suspected. So what do you take from that? That he he did it himself right? And like I said some people think seem to believe that this is what the family accepts as fact as well because Allegedly, they stopped posting on all their social media about Kelly, about his disappearance, about his death, as soon as the coroner's report came back. I just would love to know why they accepted this as truth. What don't we know? Because based on everything we know, this sounds absolutely asinine and ridiculous. In my opinion. Now with that and what I'm about to say next, please keep in mind that the family, the loved ones, and the police most likely have more information than I do, have more information than even the media does. You know the police don't release everything to the media and they don't release even everything to the family. So with that being said, they might again know something that I don't, that we don't, have some kind of information that backs up this theory. However, the gun never being found is what does it for me. Didn't they search the entire lake? Wouldn't you search the entire entirety of Lake Lanier? We know they searched five mile radius on the ground, so they didn't find it there. So if it's not in the lake and it's not within five miles of the ground, what did he do? Shoot himself and then go and, and get rid of the gun and then go back and die. It just doesn't make sense, right? I mean, am I, am I wrong? 
The episode of Disappeared ends though with the family waiting for the autopsy to come back. And I remember I had to look this up years later to find out what had actually happened to Kelly. So based on all of the information that I've reported to you in part one and the little bit that I've reported to you in this one, I'm going to go over all of the little odd things that I came across that didn't make any sense to me. And maybe you guys can help me figure these things out, explain these things to me, elaborate on these things, or just agree with me. Hit me up in the comments. Odd thing number one for me was that Jessica had stated that the day before he officially went missing, because he went missing in the middle of the night, 4 o'clock, 4.30 in the morning, Kelly had been very sick and suffering from a really severe sinus infection to the point that he did not go out all day. He didn't want to run any errands. Despite it being his day off, he didn't want to do anything except stay in the house. He was also so sick, according to Jessica herself, that she had to ask him to leave their bedroom and go and sleep on the couch that night because he was coughing, tossing and turning so much. He was disrupting her sleep and she had to be work early the next morning. Remember how Kelly was seen inside the gas station convenience store at around 9 o'clock p.m. that night? If he was this sick, why did Jessica send him to the store? Why didn't she go to the store herself? Because it was plainly stated that he went to the store to pick up a few items for Jessica. I'm not saying that's suspicious that she had anything to do with it. I'm just wondering why you would send your boyfriend, you know, that you live with, that you've been with for a long time, that I'm assuming you're in love with, out sick like that. He didn't even want to go and have any fun or do anything on his only day off for the week because he was sick, but he goes to the store for you. Why couldn't she go? I just think that's a little selfish and that's my opinion. I would have went to the store myself and seen if he needed anything because he was so sick. Could just be me though. If I'm wrong, let me know. And it's not so much that that's suspicious, but that started me getting a negative thought about Jessica's character right off the bat. This actually leads me right in to the second thing that I found odd when going through all of this information about this case. He's so sick that he can sleep. He's coughing. He's tossing and turning. And you kick him out of the bed and ask him to go onto the couch? Don't you take the couch? I know I'm seeming to come off very suspicious of Jessica, but I have my reasons, which I'm going to state here. Again, she's not been convicted of anything. She's not guilty of anything officially. These are just my opinions. And these are just things that I found odd. I have to keep saying that. So you guys keep that in your head. I'm not accusing her of anything. I'm simply pointing out my opinion of the way she acted. Was there a reason he had to be on the couch that night? And another thing, was it because he was sick or is it more likely that they were having an argument? I mean, think about it, guys. She said she heard him turn off the Xbox, but the next day they found that the character had been left idle, which means he got up and quickly left and just left his game laying there, maybe thinking he was going to come back to it. So who actually made up the couch? Is it reasonable to assume that he left his character idle, but he took the remote, put it at the end of the couch, took off the headset, put it at the top of the couch as if he were going to lay down, then rushed out the door to grab his firearm? Or is it more likely that because the character was left idle that he kind of took the headphones off and put them somewhere like he was sitting in a chair. I saw the chair on the disappeared episode, put it somewhere near the chair, put the controller down like on the table or on the floor in front of him. She said when she woke up the next day, the couch was made up, the headphones were placed neatly next to the head as though he had laid down and just took them off to go to sleep, and the controller was placed neatly on the bottom arm of the couch. This makes no sense for the character having gone idle, which is backed up by Alan, Kelly's father, who saw it the next day. This is weird. Is it not weird? So I'm sitting here, I'm playing my Xbox, and I hear a noise. I'm going to be like, hold on, let me go make up the couch place this like I'm laying down, no big deal, hide my wallet, keys, and cell phone underneath the comforter, then run out really quick without putting on a jacket, without putting on regular shoes, grab a gun, leave the door open. I mean, he was obviously in a rush. We said that all throughout the first part. This part is what really got me. I feel like she was lying about something. I don't know what, and it could just be something innocent that at this point she really can't come out with because she had already told the lie and would look suspicious. In my opinion, she looks suspicious AF because of all this stuff. But wait, there's more. 
if they were in an argument and that's the reason Kelly either walked out of the bedroom to sleep on the couch or did she lead him, as I asked before, to go into the living room for whatever reason, why not just say that? Why hide it? Why go so far as to hide it? Now, I don't know if they were in an argument, but that just seems to make more sense to me. They got into an argument. Kelly stormed out of the bedroom where she told him to get out. He goes out. He starts playing his Xbox. She gets up to harass him in the middle of the night or something. They get into another argument. Or she gets up to genuinely see if he's okay and see what he's doing. And they get into another argument and he storms off. Another thing that I mentioned in the first part of this was... How I thought it was weird that Jessica had found the door ajar because after seeing Kelly not in the living room, seeing that he had probably left, she took the dogs out before searching the rest of the house or looking for Kelly. But as I mentioned in part one, that could just be me. I'm not a dog person. And she did say she had it in the back of her mind that he went to the gym. Jessica's demeanor, which I mentioned in part one briefly, Everybody else, they couldn't contain themselves. They they were crying. Like, they, they just couldn't stop sobbing. And Jessica was very matter-of-fact, reading off a grocery list. I woke up, and this is how the bed was. This is what happened. This... Now, that was when it was just one-on-one -on -one interview with Disappeared. When they showed clips of her with the family and friends and volunteers around, she was bawling her eyes out, which could just be how she is. Maybe she can shut it off like that. I know I can, so... That may or may not be a little suspicious. I hope you guys are following me here. Another thing though, why assume that he went to the gym? He was so sick the night before, like right at 3.30 in the morning too, when she had last seen him playing the Xbox, when she said she heard him turn it off, but he didn't turn it off because character was left idle. He just wakes up, you know, four out, three hours later and is like, oh yeah, feeling much better. going to go to the gym now after three hours of sleep. That doesn't I, I don't know. Maybe at that point, you're just trying to hold on to anything to not really believe your loved one is missing. Like I said, thank God I've never had to be in this situation. So I don't really know. And I don't mean to pick on Jessica, but in my opinion, a lot of these things just don't make sense. I mean, like I said, come at me, correct me if I'm wrong or if you disagree, because it's my opinion and can't really be wrong. But if you disagree, let me know. One other thing I want to talk about is that phone call. To me, that's very odd that a phone call was made from Kelly's phone to Jessica's phone right before 3.30 when she says that she went out to check on Kelly. He said he was finishing up his game and then going to sleep. She said she went back in the room to lay down to go to sleep herself because she had work early in the morning and she heard Kelly turn the Xbox off. That drives me nuts because that was obviously a blatant lie. The voicemail that was left from Kelly's phone was like muffled, sounded kind of like a pocket dial. But if he's in his pajamas, does he have pockets in his pajamas and he has his phone in his pocket while he's playing his Xbox at 3, 3.30 in the morning? I want to know what that call was about. And I really think it was something more than what they made it out to be. I think that should have been investigated way more. I do not think Kelly Nash killed himself and... I feel very brave saying that because I don't want anyone to come at me and be like, well, what do you know? What I know is the information that I presented in part one. And based on that information, in my opinion, I don't think he did it. I think this is worth mentioning as well, even though I cannot confirm it as fact, according to some media sources and some people on Reddit claiming to know Jessica, she has a past history from before Kelly with methamphetamine abuse, so could some kind of drug thing have played in there? Could Kelly have been going to meet somebody for her? That's why he called her. I mean, I don't know. I, you know, I just thought that was worth mentioning. I don't even know how it would really tie into this case. It would take me such a long time to tie that into everything else. But I think it is worth mentioning because I do think she's a shady person in my opinion. Back to the phone call, something I forgot. Do you guys really think her story about not knowing that he called um, and it going to voicemail, all that stuff that the police never investigated is reasonable. Or do you think it more reasonable and likely that perhaps Kelly called her not from the living room that night? There is no proof that she got up at 3.30 and saw him sitting there playing that Xbox. And he had called her right before that. The police never looked to see where Kelly's phone was when it made that call. Was it in the same house? 
Kelly could have been calling her from anywhere. He could have not been home. He could have never went home past his nine o'clock visit to the gas station convenience store to grab her some things, which I still find weird why they didn't say like snacks or cigarettes or whatever. We don't know that he was there. We don't know for a fact that she saw him in the middle of the night. This case is just like my head's ready to explode with all the things that are so wrong and that don't make sense to me. What I want to know is what really happened in the house that night. Why wasn't Jessica Sexton just for the simple fact that she was the only one who could really say about Kelly's last hours? Why wasn't she given a polygraph? Why wasn't she given a polygraph to prove, yes, she saw him at 3.30 a.m. Yes, she heard him turn the Xbox off. Yeah, she doesn't know what happened. She wasn't given a polygraph. I don't get it. I don't understand how police rules her out and rules out foul play at the house simply because they didn't find anything in the woods in his backyard. How, what does one have to do with the other? I just don't get it, guys. And one more thing that I heard about Jessica is that she had a husband before Kelly. That's right, she was married. Her ex-husband had committed suicide allegedly under suspicious circumstances. Guys, that's all I have for you today. I know this video is a lot shorter than the first one, but I really needed to get all of this out. I hope I wasn't, as usual, going too fast for you to understand what I was saying. Please know anybody that watches this, that knows this family, again, disclaimer, I am not trying to hurt anyone, say anyone's guilty of anything, but I think these are questions that need to be asked. These are my opinions. This is my show. My intentions are just to call attention to the suspicious nature of Kelly Nash's death. I'm an outsider. I don't know the family again. So this is what it looks like to me. Let me know in the comments, guys, what you think. If anyone needs to email me, my email is gemmajadeyt at gmail.com. Guys, if you liked this video, if you enjoyed hanging out with me, please give it a big thumbs up. Subscribe if you aren't already and make sure you hit me up in the comments. Um, I really love discussing these cases with you guys. I love seeing your thoughts, your opinions, even when they differ from mine. I love the discussion back and forth. I'm wondering if it's just me. Like, do I just have a paranoid brain thinking all these things? Or is there something more to this? What do you guys think? I am dying to know. Please check out the description box. You will see links to mine and Steve Stockton's podcast, Strange Things with Steve, with Steve Stockton and Gemma Jade. Click there. Go over. We've got three episodes up. We're on a little bit of a hiatus. We're writing a book now. So we will be back with that in, you know, a couple weeks or so. We just have a lot going on. Please check out on any Sunday, our Sunday night live stream. A link to that will also be in the description box. Fireside chat with Steve and Gemma. Come on into the live stream and be our guest. We don't have guests on that show. Steve and I just talk back and forth with the people in the chat. It's a really good time. I'll put at least one, possibly two links to that in the description box. That's every Sunday night at 7 p.m. Eastern time, 4 p.m. Pacific time, and midnight UK time. I keep going to say 5 UK time because it's five hours ahead of me. Also in the description box, if you are able to financially support me and the channel, I am not monetized in anything I do right now. The live streams are monetized, but that is not my channel. Guys, please consider becoming a patron. If I can get some more people to sign up for my Patreon, I can do Patreon only content. I'm working on giving early access to videos for the five or six patrons that I have now and anyone who has donated through PayPal. The link to the Patreon will be in the description box. Come and join it. I say little hellos. I chat back and forth with my patrons to the best of my ability. And there is some really cool stuff coming up as soon as I get enough patrons. So if you don't want to sign up for monthly, please click the link to donate how much or as little as you want to my PayPal. You can make a one-time donation there. It doesn't have to be recurring like Patreon. And I will give you access to the Patreon only content if you donate through PayPal when you donate through PayPal as well. As soon as I start the Patreon only content, I'm sorry to my patrons now that I don't have enough to really give you guys anything significantly special to yourselves, but know that you're very special to me and I'm going to do the best I can to get something out to you very, very soon. I appreciate you guys so much. 
if you can't financially help me out in supporting the channel, that's fine. You guys can give me so much support by clicking on one of the other links to the podcast, to the live stream, subscribing here, liking this video, sharing it if you think it's worth sharing. Also, one last thing, Steve Stockton is working on producing my audio only podcast called Crime Bomb with Gemma Jade, and that is actually going to have merch finally. Guys, I am working on getting 1,000 subscribers by my birthday on March 1st. So if you know anyone, if you're not subscribed, please hit that button, tap that bell, and give me a like. Be kind to each other, guys. It doesn't cost anything and can gain you so much. Let your kindness show. Love you guys so much, and I will see you next time. Thanks so much for hanging out with me. Bye-bye. <laughs>